What captures our attention most is often something that is both unique but also familiar. It is the familiarity that allows us to understand what is taking place, but it is the uniqueness and the difference from that which we are accustomed to that creates an interest factor. When things are so foreign that we have no form of reference with which to grasp what's occurring, we then lose interest. It is about finding the same, but different. And that is exactly what we're going to be doing today. <laughs> Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Campaign Creator Series. My name is Guy and today we're going to convert the Japanese from the Edo period into a fantasy period. We're going to go through that conversion process. I've chosen a few cultural aspects, a few things from last week's video that inspire me to create this fantasy-based race. And I hope that you'll agree with me in terms of what I've decided to do. Certainly it seemed to inspire me anyway towards a particular race. So this is my thought process on uh, how I translate the whole thing into a fancy thing. Today's episode is sponsored by World Anvil, worldanvil.com. If you don't know where to find them, worldanvil.com. It doesn't get easier than that. They're going to be uh, storing all of the information that we have come up with during the campaign creator series so we can access it and share it with all of our players as well as add in secrets and developments that only we can see. Just one of the many aspects of World Anvil that makes it such a useful and powerful world building tool. Now, let's jump into the peaceful isolationists that the Japanese Edo period was, and how do we translate these peaceful isolationists into something that will work in our fantasy game? Let's start off with the race. Let's start off with the race. Now, I always like to choose a race first because it's going to inform us on a whole bunch of things. It's also it's going to principally, principally, it's going to remind us of what we expect. I'm going to talk a bit, a bit more about that. I think one of the uh, professors is going to deal with that. But the idea is that we're trying to find a race that will fit this or create a new race that would work on its own. So whenever you've got a fantasy world, let's say you go, well, we, last week we had the Darkini, which is really a cat folk like race. Well, not last week, the week before. We've got the Darkini, this cat like race. Let's let's work on something else. And then we try and find a fit. So when I think of the Japanese, there are a couple races that come to mind, and there's some that don't come to mind and that I've added in anyway because it's a worth it's a worthwhile thought experiment to try and see if it fits. So the elves. Traditionally, elves live in forests. They um, have this wonderful commune with nature. They are fairly peaceful. They're quite aloof. So it kind of fits with the Japanese almost perfectly. Let's try out some other things. Bugbears. Highly organized, militant, expansionistic. During the Edo period, the exact opposite. Would it be interesting to see bugbears, effectively dog folk, I suppose you could say, or sort of, um, running around? Interesting opposition to our Darkini. I'm not feeling it, though. I'm not feeling it. This period of peace doesn't seem to work. And then dwarves. We don't think of necessarily dwarves as having a particularly Japanese cultural space. Dwarves traditionally are Germanic or Scottish, as popular culture would inspire. Could we have Japanese dwarves, short individuals with great big beards that include this culture? I could certainly see that working in terms of these beards being turned into these very elaborate uh, devices to show the pageantry. They're not particularly militarily functional. They're going to get in the way of things. But samurai armor, to a large degree, there was a lot of stuff that got in the way as well. It could work with the dwarves, now that I think about it. And I wonder if maybe this video should be remade with dwarves. I chose elves, to put you out of your misery. I chose elves, and we're going to unpack why I think elves work the best out of these options. Although dwarves, they really are coming back to me. I think elves work the best. They're long-lived. So a 250-year-old kingdom or system of government, as it was, I think works quite well from that perspective. There are a lot of things that the Japanese do that take a lot of time. And again, I think the elvish temperament, this long-lived temperament that why rush things, I think it fits quite well with that. 
So they kind of reinforce each other. So when I'm trying to fit a race with a culture or a culture with a race, it's important that we bear in mind a whole bunch of things that come with that race, those preconceived ideas. So that's something to bear in mind. The caste system I could see working with elves. The elves, again, this idea of the noble born, those that don't get dirty, those that don't engage with the other races, and then working our way down, quite literally just copying that racial, uh, the caste system, I should say, from the Japanese Edo period. We can copy that almost straight across, right the way down to merchants and craftsmen, the ones that deal with humans and dwarves and orcs and all those those sort of things we can definitely have those in there whereas it's the noble samurai and it's the daimyos and the shogun who are the big noble protectors and of course the ultimate elvish emperor right at the top who's lived for a thousand years again that kind of ties in quite nicely for me so i think that works quite well the pursuit of art the ceremonies the enjoyment of nature it, it fits it really does fit there's very little conversion that we need to do necessarily I think it works quite well. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself here and I'm going to get shouted at. But yes, the idea of this this mix up, this this mix match. What does it what does it do for us? I think Demnos would be best to handle this one. There are a lot of things that we look for when we are trying to create our characters. Usually it is the fulfillment of some kind of desire or passion. We might want to explore being lithe and highly athletic, or perhaps physically domineering. Perhaps it's the intellect that we seek to create a titan within the world that we're going to be playing in. Whatever the cause, whenever designing a race or a culture that is going to have some kind of influence on the player character's abilities and attributes, it's important to bear in mind that there are other races out there who might offer similar things, in which case what advantage does yours offer aside from the cosmetic? Although as GMs we often hope for players who don't have interest in creating values or creating individuals based on statistics, this is very often not the case, and so we must be cognizant of the fact that whatever we create should have value. Pageantry. Pageantry, again, ties in these very slender, very beautiful elvish folk, which I think mirrors the current Japanese space. There was a thing on television the other day where they were talking about the average weight of Japan being so low that there was sort of feeding programs or, or programs trying to get the weight average up because they're very slender, very lithe people. So the, the, the pageantry, I think, works very well. The long-lasting ceremonies we've spoken about. Elves have a propensity to last forever. I think it's important that we, we look at that. The clothing design, again, I think that it's about translating and saying, well, maybe it's not a kimono. Maybe it is this long flowing robe and high crests. I don't know why. I think with the elves, it's high crests. Again, what we want to do is we want to say that the elves have got these pointed ears. And again, it's not to say that the Japanese have got weird hairstyles, although they did have particularly interesting hairstyles during the Edo period. But these arched ears of the elves, perhaps the clothing could have these very high arches, very high curves and things, which prevented them from doing anything particularly dramatic, but was very visually powerful. This wonderful, wonderful display of power, of wealth, of ability. We could play along with those kinds of things. The food, those mochi uh, things. Again, the idea of it being subtle. The idea of it being about taking a foodstuff that you can manipulate and quite literally make look as if it was something else. That you can buy mochi balls that look like apples or oranges, and when you bite into them, there is an orange inside, but the whole thing is coated in mochi first. The idea that the food is about how it looks rather than eating massive amounts. This is not a quaffing culture. This cult, you don't gorge in, unless you're really, 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 really wealthy. It's about little bits and little pieces and enjoying the moment of each piece rather than rushing through it. So we can definitely do that. The idea of theatre where it's a lot of 
representation, a lot of very technical skill. I think that fits very, very well with an elvish kind of space. So now we're starting to, to get a very strong sense, I think anyway, a very strong case that the Japanese, I think, work very, very well as elves. Now, uh, before we go too far, again, we've got to talk about this pageant. We've got to talk about these kinds of things. Um, Artuzi? Of course they'd turn to me for fashion sense and uh, dramatic clothing. When it comes to these kinds of things, you yourself don't have to be an expert on clothing design or on the fashions and faux pas of contemporary society. That's not what is important. What is important is for you to develop a very brief vocabulary, a few words that will describe in infinite simplicity the infinite complexity of the costuming and the wardrobe that is being worn. There is a great amount of value if you can find one or two reference photograph photographs that you could then draw from. So you might describe an elaborate shoulder piece of costuming made from the finest silks from afar and bejecked with dazzling jewels. Or it could be a headdress made out of horse hair that has been dyed as black as midnight, dotted with pearls such that the heavens themselves might might be jealous for such beauty presented down on earth. It is about the way in which one describes the items of clothing, not specifically the details, the minutiae of how it looks, but the overall impression that it is making that is far more important than each stitch and line. It's pageantry, darling. It's about showing the world that you're brilliant, even if you're actually not. I mean, obviously, he knows about clothing. Anyway, so when it looks, when we look to then Warcraft, this is a peaceful period. There is not a lot of us, uh, there's not a lot for us to draw upon in terms of interesting things. The jitter, that weapon, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. But from a, a, a game perspective, it's a club. Effectively, it's a club. Maybe we can twist it a little bit. Maybe I'm being too simpl simplistic in that. Yes, we've got the katanas, and yes, we've got all of those other things. But again, the idea is to take the culture as it was and transpose it into a fantasy environment. So castle design, I think, is where it gets interesting, where we have these wonderful pitched roofs and crow-like castles or castles dedicated to the worship of uh, shrines, dedicated to the worship of animals, but the shrines are these pagodas which rise up and are very, very visually impressive, if not technically impressive. So when we talk about the materials being used, I mean, here's a little video. This is the first moat of Matsumoto Castle. They're all connected, bringing it together as one almost river system, but still a major obstacle to cross. We've got these large collections of ducks again to give us protection, but this is the main gate entrance. Now, what makes it interesting is that it's a double gate entrance. It does a dog leg, very similar to the Crusader castles like Crack the Chevaliers. In my hand, I've actually got one of the helmets that would have been worn by the defenders of this castle, originally armed with crossbows and bows, and then later on with firearms. Quite fitting, I would say, as it has the emblazon of the daimyo that would have been in charge of the castle on the front. Always useful to know who you're attacking. Now, as we go in through this gate, the important thing to bear in mind is there's no portcullis here. This is just heavy, heavy, heavy wooden doors allowing entrance or exit into the castle. Now, let's go further into the courtyard and we'll see what makes it interesting is that you're still being fired upon by archers, gunmen from all over the place. And of course they can see out through all of these shots and things. So this is a very interesting design from a control perspective. Players, characters entering into this castle and the gates were open between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. every day. Characters entering into this castle would have to go through this place and you'd have guards checking at this point whether they're allowed into the castle or not. And of course, if they're not, there are people all over the place to make sure that they don't get access. So magic 
is an elvish thing traditionally. When you combine that together with respect for others and these walls that are not particularly strong, not particularly designed to withstand trebuchets and that sort of thing, what would? Ah, well, magic shields would certainly do that. So perhaps the elves have got some kind of magical intervention that allows that to happen. That's certainly something that meshes the two together quite nicely. Sumo is also something of a contradiction when you look at Japanese culture. Like I said, the population is underweight, and yet their great sport is about titanic athletes who consume vast amounts of food and exercise beyond the limits almost of human endurance to become these massive titanic warriors. I think it's quite funny to think of these elves having a similar kind of sport. We could have archery, of course, and the Japanese certainly have amazing archers and horse archers and all that like. But if there was this Japanese, oh, this Japanese, this elvish wrestling, I think that could be quite useful too. Just again, here's a ceremony. Here's a, uh, an individual of importance going to go and wrestle. Do they have to be huge, massive individuals, morbidly obese? Do we need that component of it? I think it's a display of power. So perhaps it could be a magical display. It could be something along those lines, where again, lots of pageantry, lots of display, and then bang, a very short, sharp, in contrast to the rest of the culture, combat. I think that could work. I think that could work. The samurai, of course, very still trained in the art of sword play, but trained in the art of it, not often accustomed to using it. I think elves would do the same thing. We're going to practice our weaponry. We're going to practice our maneuvers, but we're not at war with anyone. So we're not actually ever putting it into practice. And because we're in a peaceful space, it's never used against others except in a sparring kind of environment, which is a safe environment. So there isn't necessarily a drive to war. Now, where we need to be aware of things, though, is that if there are external forces that might be threatening this kingdom, it's one thing for the Japanese during the Edo period to be isolationist. They're on an island in an ocean and there's a sea closer to Korea and that sort of thing. But they're fairly isolated by geography as well as by attitude. If your elves are not isolated by geography, if they are part of a bigger continent, then there might be standing armies where there are conflicts with the other outlying kingdoms and things. Something to bear in mind. But I, again, I'd like to take it back to the pageantry, to this, this idea that the PCs will arrive in this place where they have no ranking whatsoever. They're foreigners. They're the gaijin. They're the weird, strange interlopers into this kingdom. They're not unwelcome because, remember, there was that honesty and loyalty and, and diligence and respect. Those kinds of things were all still very much part of this culture. But they're the foreigners, and they're looking into this space where you were not allowed to wear swords. You're not allowed to bear arms in cities and in villages and things. It's about how good do you look? And you look like you're covered in chainmail, which is badly forged and is crude. And so you really have no place here whatsoever. You're going to get flocked by craftsmen trying to sell you all of their, or merchants trying to sell you all of these cool things. So something to think about there. Again, though, May maybe we'll get some more info maybe we'll get some more insight. General Kuda? Anything? Some of the most dangerous creatures are very subtle, and some creatures that seem insurmountably powerful are actually not. Just because it seems to be weak does not necessarily mean that it is weak. And just because it seems to be strong does not mean that it necessarily will be strong. Usually it is strong, because if it looks strong, it's usually strong. But sometimes it is not. Do not fall into that trap. Always make sure that what it seems to be is sometimes what it is and sometimes what it isn't. Hmm. And so there we are. That is my fantastical interpretation of the elves. Not a lot to do, not a lot to transcribe, because I think it already kind of fits very, very well with what we expect from elves. It's definitely not the traditional high elves in their forested castles or stone castle, depending on whatever history you, you choose to read. I think it gives us a very good basis. And if you can 
almost imagine something like Matsumoto Castle with its green roofs rather than black roofs. It almost has an organic feel to it. So it does still give our elves a, a, a slightly better in commune with nature. The fact that the farmers overproduce on rice so the, the, there's no starvation. It's a, it's a fairly stable structure. I think that represents a fairly stable-minded people which I think elves really do respond to. It also gives players who want to play this elf from this Japanese-inspired space the opportunity to go and explore. My kingdom is, is, is pretty good. My kingdom is actually perfect. There's not much that anyone could want. I want to go and see what other kingdoms are doing. Oh my goodness, what, what, there's chaos, murder, may It's so contradictory to what the Edo period was all about. And that's what we look for. We look for things that allow us to create these punctuated moments where we go, that's that culture, that's that culture. I would rather go and adventure in this particular space. It's a nicer bunch of people, ultimately, and you're not likely to get killed. Although there were some particularly horrific punishments that were meted out in the Edo period. Um, one of them was being sawn in half. You were hung up upside down, spread open, and then cut from groin to neck with a saw. Not a very nice way to die, or boiled alive in oil. Rather, rather distasteful. Anyway, they are always going to be criminals, and they always need to be dealt with. And again, it's about pageantry and display. What's more visual than being cut in half or boiled alive? alive. Anyway, I hope this has inspired you to perhaps look at your elves and go, well, let's add in a subset. That's certainly what I'm going to be doing. Although the dwarves, really, it would be very interesting. I think we need to find a culture for the dwarves next. There have been some great suggestions that have come through already in terms of the uh, Mazulu. There were suggestions for some very, very, very awesome cultures, some very obscure cultures, which I absolutely relish the idea of going to go and research uh, and explore. Leave your comments down below on which culture you'd like us to talk about. Next week, we will be designing a castle based off of Matsumoto in Dungeon Fog, our other sponsor of this series. And I think that's going to be a lot of fun as we outline a castle that makes use of a giant man-made river and ducks. You know, something that keeps getting forgot a lot is... The players are going to be expecting certain things. You walk into a place, you walk into a culture, there's a certain amount of pre-expectation already built into the imagination of the player characters and the players by default. That means when the players arrive and they're not getting what they expect, that can be that can be very useful as a tool. At the same time, realizing that they are expecting tree hugging, leaf eating kind of elves, whatever it might be, the fact that they are expecting that when they arrive, if you give them that, but then it isn't actually tree eating or leaf eating. It's that machi stuff that the, 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 that he was talking about. But it's in the shape of a leaf. It's like, here's your expectation, but we're going to ramp it up to the next level by making it include the culture that we're trying to draw from and making it our own. So play on the expectations of your players to give you guidance as to where things should go, but also how to twist it up so that your players go, oh, I was expecting that, but I wasn't expecting it like that. That truly is a great moment. Everyone will remember it moving forward as this, it was so cool. We, we didn't see it coming. It was, it was a moment. That's what you're aiming for. Nonetheless, he forgot to say goodbye, so I'm going to do it for him. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Hit that bell so you know when more videos are going to be coming out. It's every week. I mean, that's not a, it doesn't take a genius to work that one out. Nonetheless, we certainly hope you enjoyed this uh, presentational video thing and hope to see you again next week. Until then, from me and clearly my very bad cold, I'll say happy campaign creating.